Hello, um, my name is Pavlina Chernova and I direct the Economic Democracy Initiative at the Open Society University Network. I teach economics at Bard College and I'm a research uh, scholar at uh, the Levy Economics Institute. Today I am delighted uh, to speak with uh, Thomas Piketty, a scholar who perhaps uh, single-handedly changed the global conversation on inequality. Uh, he is Professor of Economics at the Paris School of Economics and the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences. And he's a uh, co-director of the World Inequality Lab and uh, the World Inequality Database. Thomas, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Thank you. Last year, uh, a group of uh, female scholars, including myself, published a manifesto um, on the need to democratize work after the pandemic. Um, today, uh, the, the manifesto was published in uh, around the world in many uh, papers, and, and today uh, we are following on that momentum with a global forum uh, on democratizing work to take place uh, during October 5th through 7th. Um, and uh, the basic premise of that work was that uh, people are not simple uh, resources, that human well-being cannot be governed by market forces alone. And uh, we highlighted uh, three uh, principles of the manifesto. Uh, the first one is that uh, it's time to democratize firms by involving employees uh, in decisions relating to their lives and the future of the workplace. Uh, the second was um, the need to decommodify work um, by collectively guaranteeing useful, uh, dignified employment, employment opportunities to all. And of course, to decarbonize the planet, um, to marshal our collective resources and address uh, climate change. And I wanna thank you very much for your support from the very beginning of this journey. So uh, today I just wanted to um, talk briefly uh, about how um, the manifesto resonates with your work. Um, are there specific aspects or principles um, that specifically um, connect um, to your research? Yes, sure. So first, let me say, you know, how glad I am to, you know, participate uh, uh, to this uh, movement, which, uh, you know, I think is really fantastic. You know, I've, I've been in touch with uh, Isabel, Dominique, and, and many other participants to the project for, for many years now. And some of you in the group I met more recently, and I discovered their work more recently. But, you know, I think what you've put together is, is extremely important. So, you know, I, I don't know where to start. There are many proposals which to me are absolutely central and certainly you know the, the sharing of, uh, of power uh, within companies and giving more uh, uh, power and, and, and to participate to decision making for workers representatives is absolutely uh, central and, and uh, you know I've been following the proposal of Isabel in this direction for a long time I think you know this, this is a central discussion we need to have I, I, you know, I would say, and you know, I'm not saying this because I'm talking with you, but I think you know the job guarantee uh, uh, proposal, you know, is, is at least as important because you know, I, I, it took me some time, you know, to sort of fully understand the, 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 you know, the importance of this. But, but the more I think about it, and and you know, I've read your your book, and 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 I think it's. Uh, it's really one of the sort of very powerful ways that can contribute both to the decommodification and to the decarbonization of the economy. So, you know, it's not, there's no magic bullet, you know, it's not that there's not going to be one policy that's going to do it all. You know, it's really a set of policies. It involves uh, the, the sharing of power in, in companies. It involves uh, basic income, you know, basic income is important, but, you know, basic income is, is, is very basic, you know, in the sense that the kind of, amount of income that people have in mind when they talk about the basic income is typically, you know, between 50% or 75% of a, of a full-time minimum wage. You're not going to go very far with this. And so that's very important. We need to have it. We, to some extent, we already have it in a number of European countries. It needs to be more universal, but I think it's important to call it basic income rather than universal income because sort of universal income is sort of promising more than what it is really. And, and basic income is more, you know, that's a minimum guarantee. That's good, but you know, that's half or three quarters of minimum wage income. The job guarantee is more ambitious. So we need to have both at the same time because the job guarantee, uh, you know, is offering uh, the idea of, uh, you know, a full-time job at 
at least the minimum wage, you know, at least full-time minimum wage with the minimum wage itself, which should be, uh, you know, increased, you know, in particular for the federal minimum wage in the US, but more generally, you know, depending on the possibility in each country, this needs to be a decent living wage. This is a full-time income. And, and most importantly, it comes together with, with the process uh, by which you empower, uh, uh, you know, local actors, uh, associations, municipalities, new actors to redefine what economic value is and what redefine our priorities. So, you know, I think that uh, to me, that's a very uh, important component. I, I would add that, you know, we also together with, you know, basic income, job guarantee, we also need to, to redistribute uh, property rights. You know, we cannot continue with this kind of concentration of property, even if we give more work, more, more power voting rights to workers, uh, uh, you know, you will still have shareholders and you don't want, uh, you know, shareholders to have uh, such a concentrated uh, uh, structure of, uh, of share ownership. And so to me, this, you know, if you look at the long run evolution of the concentration of wealth, uh, you know, there's, there's been very limited progress in the long run, you know, the, the, the top 1% or 10% share may be smaller today than what it was in the 19th century, but the bottom 50% is just as small, you know, in the, in the US, it could be 2% of total wealth, in France, it could be 4%, but, you know, it's just ridiculously small. And so the, the middle, the 40% in between the top 10, the bottom 50 are, uh, you know, have a bigger share today than in the 19th century. But if you look at the bottom 50%, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's still close to zero. And even the intermediate 40%, their share has been declining. So we cannot just wait for growth competition to, to spread the wealth. You know, we need to think of other mechanisms. I've, I've talked about, you know, the redistribution of inheritance, the redistribution of wealth. But, you know, in any case, this would have to come you know, on the top of, of a long sequence of transformation, institutional transformation. And, I, you know, I think the, the job guarantee um, uh, is, is really one of the key steps which probably should be put in place, you know, before really you know, thinking about the redistribution of property or together, right? but, you know, in terms of sequencing of reform, you know, that should be really high uh, priority, you know, together with, uh, with, of course, more worker rights uh, in companies as workers, independently from any, uh, any, uh, any shareholder. Uh, Right. So yes, that's for me. You know, that's one of the one of the key proposals which I which I, I support a lot. I really appreciate uh, you saying that, and I have uh, you know taken a lot of inspiration from Tony Atkins's work uh, that I know you have worked with him, and I also owe you a bit of debt of gratitude too because uh, your data on inequality was so important, and uh, when it came out, I was curious to see. Um, what happens during periods of growth, uh, the old argument that uh, a, a rising tide lifts all boats. And when I consider just the growth periods using your data, it was very clear that growth actually delivered more inequality. Um, but uh, the manifesto and our work um, is a recognition that these are multidimensional uh, battles that are all connected. They have the same root that when we talk about uh, democratic workplace, it is so dependent on how people experience economic insecurity, uh, whether you have just precarious job or you have no job and that our fates in a sense are intertwined, the fates of the working people and those who are not working and those who are working without pay. Um, and so that um, the job guarantee is one way to secure a basic, um, basic uh, human right, but that also is intimately connected with the nature of work, how we work in the workplace and whether we have power, decision-making power, which is why this, this uh, union of forces has been so uh, wonderful for all of us in the research team. And I wanted to connect that a bit more to your own research because um, you have, you know, you have put a spotlight on uh, this, uh, the discussion on distribution and pre-distribution, and that so often um, our attention is directed to tax policies, uh, redistributive tax policies, and they certainly have an important role to play, um, especially in reducing uh, power and the economy, um, the concentration of capital. But when you say um, uh, that, you know, uh, the focus also needs to be placed on pre-tax uh, inequality. Um, how do you think about those processes and the kind of 
policies that might move us forward. Okay, so pre-distribution, you know, getting to a, a more equitable pre-distribution, you know, requires deep structural change in, you know, in the distribution of power in society in general. So this this, this includes, you know, more more uh, workers' rights to negotiate, uh, uh, you know, better wages, better working condition, uh, you know, and other organization of of labor. This includes. Um, uh, you know, more educational justice. So, you know, access to education is one, you know, of course, of the, of the key dimensions that historically has, has brought both more equality and more prosperity. Uh, the problem is that, you know, there's still today, and there's always been a lot of hypocrisy about, you know, the idea of equal opportunity, equal access to, to, uh, to education. When we look at actual data, you know, today in the United States, and we look at, you know, percentile of parental income and probability to access higher education, you know, you get almost a straight line, you know, going from, a, you know, probability to access higher education, a little more than 20% for, for children with very poor parents and, and, you know, 95% for children with very rich parents. And it's almost a straight line. And of course, real inequality is even bigger than that because the universities you go to, uh, you know, when you're at the top have nothing to do with the kind of funding you have for, uh, uh, you know, people at, at, the, at the bottom. So, you know, educational justice and uh, a, a measurable way to, to be able to assess whether we are moving toward educational justice. You know, today we, we sort of assume that, uh, okay, if we just uh, set abstract principles about uh, educational equality and we are all in favor of equality of opportunity and blah, 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 you know, that this is going to happen. But we need to be able, you know, to measure, to set targets and, and, and to construct some, some collective sense of what educational justice uh, uh, should be. I, I also want to stress that, uh, you know, a, a big part of what uh, progressive taxation has been doing historically is actually to improve the pre-distribution. And, and that's really important because it means that the opposition that we make between pre-distribution and redistribution sometimes is, is in part artificial. First, you know, when you have progressive taxation of wealth and inheritance, especially if you were using these resources to, 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 to finance a, a minimum inheritance for all, in effect, you are uh, uh, getting to a better pre-distribution next generation. So, the, so you use progressive taxation in order to improve equality of uh, opportunities and equality of rights for the following generation. This is also true, in fact, with progressive taxation of income. What we've, what we've shown with uh, uh, Emmanuel Saez is that you know, the primary impact of the Roosevelt type uh, uh, top income tax rate of 80% or 90%, you know, between 1930 and, and 1970, uh, uh, 1980, has been, you know, to reduce uh, pre-tax inequality of labor income at the very top end. Why is it so? Well, because you know, when, you know, when you, when you're a manager and you always want to be paid 1 million more, of course, but, uh, you know, when you have a top tax rate of 90%, you know, everybody knows, you know, your subordinates, your shareholders that, you know, know that 90% of it are going to go straight to the treasury. So at some point, you know, everybody's going to tell you, well, you know, you should calm down, you know, we're going to find other ways to, you know, make you happy or whatever, but, you know, we're going, in effect, we are going to reduce the salary scale and I, I history Historically, you know, this has been the main impact and, and this has been very important because this is uh, uh, also, you know, uh, what we will need, I think, in the future, you know, if we want to reduce structurally the pre-tax salary scale is, you know, in some cases you want to make illegal, uh, 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 you know, wages above, uh, you know, 10 times minimum wage or whatever, but I think it will always have to come with a very progressive tax system at the upper end so that people don't try to get, uh, you know, extra payments through uh, uh, other shell companies or bonuses or consulting fees. So you need at some point, you know, even if you have a strict salary scale uh, at, the, at the company level, if you really want to enforce it, you, you have to do it with very sharp progressive taxation. So that's going to have an impact on pre-tax uh, inequality. And historically, this is also 
you know, what has made possible the, the, the movement toward, um, uh, uh, you know, the construction of a social state, uh, you know, the, the development of social security, the development of more public education spending, uh, uh, of course, relied on more taxation for everybody from the middle class, from the lower middle class. It cannot just come from the rich, but in order to, to have the middle class, the lower middle class accept to put more resources in common uh, to the to the to social security to the education system you have to guarantee that people at the top you know are, are going to pay more than the middle class and i think you know this is of course the problem we have today which is that uh, this is not the case anymore and if we want to have a new uh, a new step in the in in the construction of a social state which also is the construction of decommodification in the sense that we need to have sectors like education, health, but also you know energy, transportation, culture, which work outside the profit motive and work outside the, the market system, and in fact work very well. You know, public health system are more efficient, uh, you know, than, than than private health system. In education, you know, people who have tried to use uh, uh, profit maximizing uh, 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 shareholder companies in, in higher education, like uh, Trump University, you know, this has been a disaster because, in fact, you are killing the kind of ethical behaviors that you need in many of these areas. And I think this could apply to more sectors in the future. But in order for this new step to be possible, I think this will have to come with also a new step in progressive taxation, which is both the force that can reduce pre-tax gap, and that's very important. You know, you want gaps from one to four, one to five. Some people will say one to ten. You know, I would say more one to four, one to five. But in any case, you know, one to fifty, one to one hundred is completely useless. You know, historically, if I compare different societies, different level of inequality, different level of prosperity, of innovation. You know, the idea that we need gaps of 1 to 50 or 1 to 100 is just completely wrong. It, it just doesn't work if you make proper historical comparison between these different uh, societies. So, you know, we that's, again, it's a package of solution uh, where, you know, each ingredient is, is very, uh, is very, uh, is very important. Yeah, thank you. I, in our work, of course, we call on governments to uh, lead the way in, especially in decarbonizing the planet, but also in putting the kind of public investments that have been neglected for such a long time. Um, and, you know, the COVID crisis for us was this kind of wake up moment, um, not only because it exposed how vulnerable uh, working people are and, you know, crisis after crisis, uh, we are presented with teachable moments and we hope that we can seize this and really reflect on the most important um, aspects of our life. Uh, people who are, are working, who are supporting um, us and of course the nature. But the other thing that I think that, that COVID um, demonstrated is that governments on short order can do very major big investments when presented with, with a shared concern. Um, in, in, in Europe, there were ways to find uh, and fund uh, large-scale programs. In the United States, we overnight spent, um, well, upwards of 20% of GDP in uh, less than a year. And so um, there is a decoupling uh, between public expenditure um, and taxation uh, as a practical matter, but also in terms of mission, uh, the mission of the public sector. and Nevertheless, we still recognize the enormous power of, of influence um, that wealth has on the political process and the necessity to remove it uh, from having such an outsized voice in policymaking. So I, I do want to thank you for, for uh, you know, first, your, your in enormously influential work. I remember a time in the 90s where people would not talk a lot about inequality. <laughs> and, and luckily that has changed um, and that has become very important. I want to just give you a chance to uh, maybe uh, say any concluding thoughts um, that you may have. 
Yeah, well, let me simply say that, you know, we need collective uh, movement, we need collective organization, and this is why I think, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the democratizing work project is so, is so important. You know, it's, it's okay, it's useful to write book and, you know, individual researchers write book and that's okay and that's useful, but, you know, that's not going to be enough. You know, we need, we need this kind of collective movement like the one you've been created. And of course, that's not going to be enough either. We also need, you know, collective organization in the form of, you know, trade unions, uh, political parties, uh, platform of transformation. You know, this is in the end what has made a difference in the 20th century. You know, how did we get to a more equal, more prosperous society? Well, you know, it was a trade union movement, uh, 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 labor parties, uh, socialist party, uh, communist party. So, you know, we are not going to have the same kind exactly of party and collective organization in the future, but it will be another set of organization uh, uh, more, you know, ad, you know, in line with the, with the big issues of the day, you know, uh, 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 you know, climate change, uh, development at the world level, uh, uh, migration, uh, you know, all, but, you know, it will also take, you know, this kind of big collective movement. And so everybody is part of the solution. And I think what's really important is not to be uh, impressed by, you know, conservative uh, economic thinking, you know, people who pretend, you know, they have built a science that is so scientific that nobody else can understand. You know, we know this is a big joke, you know, I think, uh, you know, economics is a social science, you know, we all have something to bring, sociologists, anthropologists, political scientists, historians, looking carefully at the various historical experience and, and you know, every citizen, you know, needs to uh, sort of uh, appropriate for herself, himself, you know, th this body of knowledge in order to participate to, to collective uh, action. So thanks a lot for, uh, you know, contributing so much to this with uh, democratizing work. Thank you so very much. I, I think that's a great note to end on. I appreciate your time and uh, your work as well. And um, I will urge our um, our viewers to come and join uh, the movement, uh, democratizing or uh, democratizingwork.org. Thank you so very much, uh, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Pavlina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.